Hello. Hello. <laughs> How bad is my sound? Sound great. You sure? Yeah. Oh, so weird. I have trouble with one person. Why is it we're still recording? I just paused it. Hold on. I have one person who every time I meet with her, my sound is terrible. Huh. They sound great to me. And today I wanted to talk about the code of ethics. So I taught this class last year and I wasn't sure if I would do it again um, because it's not like the most glamorous class, but I went back to the code of ethics. And I really, I, I used to read this every now and then as an agent, maybe every couple of years or so. And it really is awesome. And there's so much in it. And as a manager, I get to learn about all your deals and all the good stuff and all the bad stuff going on out there with agents that don't work in this office. And I think it's good to come back to because really a lot of the problems I see out there with other agents, it's not like every deal has a problem agent, but when you do, um, it comes back to people just not knowing the code. They don't live by the code and it's worth talking about. So for anyone who got my, who is near their email, Leah, I understand you might be driving or you're on your phone. Yeah, thanks. And that's fine. <laughs> but for anybody else, instead of looking at my face, go to the email and press on the link I sent, which was not to the, the one I sent for the, the link to the meeting, um, the one I just sent. And it was 2020 Code of Ethics and Standards of Practice. So I'm gonna go over that. And we're not gonna get through the whole code. It's very, very long, but I wanted to just get through what we do and and tell you a little bit about uh, how I feel about it and take what you, what you can from it. So I remember once I talked, I, I had a, uh, I used to talk about green building in the real estate industry. I was really into green building. And so I would be a uh, invited speaker to, uh, I, I did it at the green business round table. I did it at a rotary. I did it at, um, they had me up to tell you ride to talk about the uh, different uh, practices that were starting to go into effect in the country and with um, just about sustainability in real estate in general and where it was, where and what was coming up. And this was a good 10 years ago when I was doing this. But when I'd started out talking to people who aren't in our industry about who we are as realtors, I always started with a code of ethics because if you just go to the first part of the code of ethics is the preamble. And it's worth me saying this because I, I think it's so amazing. It's like gives me chills that we have lived by this. Yes, it's changed every few years, the code of ethics has, but this has been around for over a hundred years, really. I think it was like 1911 or so that they came up with a code of ethics. So it separates us from all the people out there who are selling real estate. Anyone can get a real estate license. I know it might take you 20 times to get your test passed, but anyone can do it. It's the people who have the R, the people who are realtors. What sets us apart from people who are not is we live by a code and it's important to us to um, bring our whole industry up and to be professionals and to represent the public as they should be represented. So the preamble, which the, the part that I love so much is under all is the land. Upon its wide utilization and widely allocated ownership depends the survival and growth of free institutions and of our civilization. Whoa, like, oh my God, it starts out with that. Realtors should recognize that the interests of the nation and its citizens require the highest and best use of the land, the widest distribution of land ownership, the creation of adequate housing, the building of functioning cities, the development of productive industries and farms, the preservation of a healthful environment. So I'd be talking to people about this who aren't in our industry and they're like, whoa, that's your code. That's pretty cool. Such industry, such interests impose obligations beyond those of ordinary commerce, meaning we can't just go out there and sell. We have to have rules of how we're going to do what we do, not just laws, but rules like obligations and standards of practice. They impose grave social responsibility and a patriotic duty to which we should dedicate ourselves and which we should be diligent in preparing themselves. Realtors, therefore, are zealous to maintain and improve the standards of their calling and share with their fellow, fellow realtors a common responsibility for its integrity and honor. It sounds almost like military, right? It's awesome. So that's where it all comes from. It all comes from just, we shouldn't just be out there, oh, another day in the office, go in there and I'm gonna sell a house to whoever wants it. 
This is about like upholding our industry and knowing we are in charge of people's biggest decisions of their lifetime and what we do with so. our jobs can change someone's course of life. Like whether <laughs> they were able to squeak into a home, whether they were able to, um, to own something and have something to pass on to their, to pass on to their children. So it is a grave social responsibility in my opinion. And that's where all of this comes from. And I am going to go ahead and yep, I got everybody. Yes, your, your voice is coming through. So I'm going to come back to you, Luis, at the end. So that's the preamble. That's where it all starts. Um, and it just says like, remember every now and then just sitting down, even with that preamble and remembering like who we are as realtors, like this, be very proud, be very proud of that R. It shouldn't be that people are realtors just because we're the only ones with the MLS, which also is true. It's because we should, we, we uh, take this as, as something that's very important to us. So then moving on, this is where I kind of want to get into how this practically works out in our working lives. The article one duties to clients and customers is really where, um, that's what the part that most people know. So it's saying when you represent someone, whether you are a landlord, it could be in your own business practices as you own a property, or you're working with a buyer, a seller, a tenant, anybody who is your client as an agent, standard of practice 1-1 one, one, one was uh, you remain obligated by the duties imposed by the code of ethics, we know this. And so it, it encompasses all real estate related activities or, and transaction, not just so when you are in public, you have the code of ethics hanging over you, not just when you're, um, you happen to be with someone who signed a contract, it has to do with anyone that you're dealing with in the public. So uh, I'm going to keep going back to this so I can, I can read a little more. Okay, 1.3. You shall not, so here's one, 1 1.3. Let's talk about in attempting to secure a listing, you can't deliberately mislead the owner as to market value. So I'm gonna, um, I want you guys to break in if I start talking about one of these standards of practice and what it means. Just break in if you have a question. Uh, I might not see your face, so raising your hand isn't gonna work. Just break in and say, hey, Heather, I have a question. But um, not misleading someone. So let's take an example. And you give me another example if you have one. Somebody, uh, I had a, one yesterday. There's an agent, there's somebody everyone knows in this office. And there's an agent in here who wants to list their home. So the seller and the buyer, or the sellers think that their home is worth, let's say it's, let's say they think their home is worth a million dollars. And they are certain it is worth a million dollars. You listen to me, you write that up and you, you, you listen at that. The agent could to get the listing, let's say you're competing against three people. And you say, you know what, let's, um, your house is so beautiful. Let's just try the market at a million dollars and we'll put it out there and, and we'll see what happens. Um, and you don't really talk to them about more than that. And let's just say that you really wanted that listing. And this is kind of like the implication of that. Let's say you really wanted that listing and you know that it's worth 800,000, but you want it, you sign it up at a million, you think, I'll just tell them in a month that, the other agents thought it's not worth a million. And so then I can somehow get it down there without having that tough conversation that I'm letting you know the market is telling you it's worth 800. It's not worth a million. I just have to put it out there. Uh, it doesn't mean that you can't take the listing higher. It's just saying that you have to have that critical conversation with that seller and not try to blame somebody else a month later and say, oh, well, you know, all the agents think it's not worth it. I think your house is worth a million, but you know, maybe we should listen. So what if the market just turned? What if, what if we had a, a huge market crash or another 911 or something happened after you took that listing and they could have gotten, maybe they could have gotten 800,000 if you had been realistic with them, if they listened to you and you were able to list it at a regular price. And now the market, we have a 2008 kind of thing and they can only get 600,000. Now, how would that change their life? Like if because of your actions and you're not wanting to face that critical conversation that now it's kind of wrecked their opportunity to get a home sale. So you just don't want to mislead people. It's okay to talk to them about it and say, this is what the market's saying. This is what I think. I really think you're going to have a hard time, but however, I will let you list up to here. It's just about being honest and truthful about, about that. So I hope that makes sense. Stacey, you took yourself off mute. Do you have a question? I just have a question. I'm sorry, it's not related to this. I just got an email from the title company and she's trying to get the um, 
reading for the propane on this. God, okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, any other questions about that? Otherwise, uh, let's let's move on. So that's just that's just an example. So. Okay, that, that's another one. It, it, a little bit differently, standard 1.4 would be, it also means that if you're representing a buyer, you can't go and say, you know, if you used me, yeah, I'm definitely gonna get you a better price. You have to be realistic. You can point to st statistics that say, if you use a buyer's agent, there's a chance you're gonna get a lot better. We do better job negotiating. We do a better job of getting you the price you wanna pay, but you can't go and like say, I can guarantee, you, just, you know that. That's kind of an obvious one. Uh, and, and also, obviously, I say obviously, maybe not so, you can represent both parties. You just have to have full disclosure to both parties that you're working with, with them both. And there's a form we sign. Let's say you're a seller's agent or you're a buyer's agent or both. And then you want to represent both parties and you check the box in the contract that allows you to represent both parties. But then there's this little form we do called the change of status form that says, remember how I said I could represent both and that you're going to be a TV instead of a seller or buyer's agent? Well, I'm just letting you know it's happening right now. Please sign the sign this so that you understand I am no longer able to give you advice on the other party because I represent both. So standard of practice 1.6, you shall submit offers and counter offers objectively and as quickly as possible. Absolutely, market like this, do not hesitate. Like you get an offer, you're out to dinner with your family, you're just about to be served, you get a call, there's an offer in you text your seller and you say, I am at Ken and Sue's, I just sat down. I am told there's an offer that came in. I'm told it's in my email. When can I talk to you later that evening? So yes, you wanna um, submit it to the, uh, your seller as soon as possible. You don't have to do it without you looking at it first. You can be in control of that process, but you just have to communicate even if you can't take care of it now, figure out a way that you can talk about it. It also means obviously if you're going out of town, that's why we have people watching our business so that you know that uh, it's waiting like, oh, I'm going out of town. It's only going to be two days, like no big deal. And you get back and there's three angry people who have input um, offers on a place that you had on the market for four years and you didn't think there'd be an offer. So just uh, th that's, that's kind of a, an obvious one as well. So another... There is also, so offers and counter offers is one thing. I will say one caveat to that. I was the sort of person, um, when you're like the most honest person in the whole world, sometimes it also brings you an anxiety when you have knowledge that you want to tell someone else. So let's say you represent someone, buyer or seller, and you got some really bad news. As a new agent, if you have a personality like that, there's a point where you wanna say, Oh my God, oh my God, that's so bad, that's so bad. I wanna call them right away and just tell them. But they're, it's okay in real estate. You have a tough deal and you have a seller that really needs to sell their property. And the buyer just, they got cold feet, they terminated. And it's seven o'clock at night. And it's okay to not make that call. You know, let, nothing's gonna happen. Just, I'm so sorry, you, you're really terminating? Oh my God, okay, I'll let them know. And you call them the first thing in the morning and you don't have to ruin somebody's night. Does that make sense? So yes, you, you want to impede knowledge as soon as possible, but at the same time, there are things that it's okay to just hold for a minute for someone's emotional like health. It's not gonna change anything if you tell them the next morning. But if there was an offer that came in, yes, you don't wait till the next morning. I don't care how tired you are. It's 10 o'clock at night and you got a text that you were just about to go to bed and there's an offer that came in. You text your person and say, I heard I just get an offer. Is there any way we can deal with this? First thing in the morning, I can be up and out of bed by 6.30 or I get the kids off to school at eight, I can deal with it then. But you at least tell them there's an offer and you don't have to deal with it right then. But if that makes sense, you always wanna like impede the knowledge, like let the other person know the knowledge if you're, um, if you're representing them. So if you have questions, just break in. Uh, okay. <laughs> if you get an offer and you're under contract, and you have, you're getting close to closing, or maybe you have a really, maybe you have the person that Stacy has. Let's say it's a seller who's really difficult to deal with, and they're under contract, and they really hate that buyer. They're like, God, I wish we could get rid of this buyer. And I, I just, Stacy, can't you do anything? Just get rid of this buyer. And you can't. And now you're getting another offer in. And you're like, oh God, I'm getting another offer. She's going to want to bail on this person, but there's no way she can. 
there is that feeling inside you that goes, God, I wish I could just make that other offer go away. I just want them to stay with this person and just get it closed. You got to tell them about the other offer. Yes, there's no way your seller can bail unless there's like your buy the buyer needs extra time. You can just say no, but you can never keep them from knowing something they need to know. So maybe there's nothing they can do about that offer and you know that. You know they can't go and sign it and be in first place. It would have to be a backup offer. And there's no way in heck they're going to get out of the offer they're in. Maybe the backup offer is $5,000 more and you see it and you go, oh my God, they're going to blame me for, for um, undervaluing their home. I told them to take this offer because I thought there'd never be another one come up. You got you to gotta do it. It's just what you do. So um, there have been times, there are a few agents in our MLS who are really good at foreclosures. And so when we had a foreclosure crisis, they were always people, uh, I don't even know if they're around anymore. I'm sure they are, but uh, I don't sell anymore, so I don't notice. Before the foreclosure crisis, they had about one or 2% of our MLS inventory because all they did is foreclosures. They represented Wells Fargo, they represented Chase Bank or someone like that. And all of a sudden there's a foreclosure crisis and their listings were like 20 or 30% maybe of our market. Like there was a lot of listings. So they went from that person that you might deal with once in your career or maybe twice, or if you're dealing with people who can't afford much in the La Plata County, you might deal with them a little more like me. And then all of a sudden you're dealing with them almost every day. So it was really frustrating because these were people that served a certain uh, aspect of our industry and they might not be the best agents. They might not call you back, but now they had most of the inventory and you were up, you had to work with them. So you would get, you would have to work with them and, and um, you knew their business practices weren't that ethical sometimes, but it's who your buyer wanted to, they want to put the offer in. So what some of these agents would do is you have this thing called a short sale. If you don't know what a short sale is, it's when somebody's behind on their mortgage. They might not, um, it, it doesn't mean that they're short on it, meaning like they owe more money than it's worth. It has nothing to do with it. It meant that they were late on their mortgage and they were in the process of foreclosing. So when that happens, the bank's in charge. You um, would put an offer in and the bank, if you had the property under contract, your buyer had the property under contract, you could be six weeks into the process and they get another offer in and the bank could cancel on you. No obligation. The seller could cancel on you. I guess it would be the seller and they could go with a new offer. So what these agents did, because the rules were a certain way to protect that seller who was possibly going to lose their home. So what these agents might do is say, don't worry, I'm not going to tell my seller there's another offer. So they just kind of put it down there because they knew it was getting in the way of them getting a closing but it's, it's like super unethical. You know, you have to pass that along to your seller because that was not representing the seller very well, right? Because they, they had signed on the bottom line. They were the listing agent for that person. And yeah, if the person's losing their home, they should possibly bail on the buyer that's almost closing to get $5,000 more from somebody else. So, you know, um, that's kind of where this would come into play. And I, you also get other people who just say, oh yeah, I told them about your offer. And you're like, there's, they even put a thing in our contract for a while where you had a, oh yeah, I guess it just went away where you had a check that you got the offer, like kind of like, yes, we're countering you, but yes, my seller saw the offer because it was supposed to stop some of that happening of agents who were unethical, who would just say, oh yeah, I gave it to them. Um, let's see, I'm moving on. Oh, okay. Standard practice one nine, revealing confidential information of clients. Just know I, this is all in our listing contracts too. You can't go and say, here's what you can't say. Uh, standard practice. You know, your person really needs an offer and you have an agent. An agent can ask you things and you just aren't allowed to respond. If somebody asks you a question, that's a leading question. You just aren't allowed to say certain things. So if they go, Hey, how motivated is your seller? And you go, and you have that look on your face, like they're really motivated. Like, just give us an offer. We got to get a closing. You can't do that. So that's revealing confidential information of clients. So have the poker face and say, oh, is your person interested? We'd love to see something come in. That's so different than please give us an offer. So just have the poker face, treat your buyers or your sellers with respect, unless they say, I don't care. I am so desperate. Tell anyone we will bring any offer. We actually require in our office, and it hasn't been used in a while. It used to be like we had a terrible market. 
and for sellers. And so we'd have people would have to sign an amendment or at least sign an email, send an email to you that says, I am allowing you to use the language motivated seller. So because that can imply bring all offers, that sort of thing, you had to get permission from the seller to do that because that just, now nobody's going to write you a full price offer. If they see that they're motivated or they see bring all offers, they're going to, you're going to start getting low balls. So it's the same way as like not wanting to reveal any confidential information. And the way I handle it is, so you have um, someone who maybe they're getting a divorce. It's a really nasty divorce or um, someone died and they have to sell this because they got to get their kid as um, the new semester's coming up at college and they got to get the sale or something else horrible, right? Uh, even if it's not, one of the things on the checklist for sellers that we created was to ask that seller, what do I say when someone says, why are you selling? And it's so heavy, right? But you put it on them and then they can say, it's okay to say we're getting a divorce and we need to move on. Then that's on them. It's way better to have an answer and to know and be um, ready for it than say, oh, I, I, I can't tell you. Because that just makes it look like there must be something going on. Because really, you can't tell them unless you have permission from the seller anyway. So confidential information. So just you are only allowed to say what your seller is allowing you to do, even if you're a seller's agent. So you can't just make something up. You can't say like, oh, uh, oh, they're in a happy marriage and they're moving up to, uh, to go be with their son. You can't make it up. So you just say like, and they'll, make, they'll say something that's true. They say, well, we decided to move to a different subdivision. Uh, and, and it's not making something up. They're moving to a different subdivision separately. Uh, so it, that's, the, that's the way you kind of get away, around that. So clients content, consent after full disclosure, or if you're, obviously, if you're required by a court order, if you have a seller who's lying to you and there's a court involved, like this, the, let's say nasty divorce, and the judge has ordered the seller to sign on the bottom line if the following happens because the wife just needs to get the house sold and the seller is on the title. This happens. And so if, if you are required by the court to do something, you do what the court says, even if your seller is saying, I don't want you to do that. It's like, well, the court ordered me to do that. It doesn't happen that often. Um, obviously, <laughs> if the client is committing a crime, it says there, we don't have to talk about that. Uh, hopefully that would never happen. Okay going on. Oh, I should have, I wish, see, I used to have this highlighted. Let's see if I have one highlighted. I could, nope. Okay. Standard practice. I'll, I'll do my highlighted one from last year because then I can talk about it. Okay. If you are managing a client's property, you, you're, you're not really going to come into this. If you had somebody who wants you to just check on their property and, and do something, let's say you have a listing and the couple had to move away and they moved very far away and you um, need to just go and check on it once a week. You gotta be diligent about that. And if you think you can't handle that uh, because there's a ton of snow and you can't really see the house, you can't really help them, just, just communicate it with them and, and let them know that uh, you don't want the house to fall in disrepair. Or maybe you're like, oh, I, I'm supposed to check on this listing once a week, but I have to walk through all that snow, so I'm not gonna do it. And what if they have some water leak that happens while you were responsible for kind of going by? It doesn't mean you're property managing, it just means you're checking on your listing because it makes sense. They don't have a friend in the area. So you're going to be doing that um, for them. Uh, compensation. Yeah, uh, here's one on 113. You just want to make sure when you have, uh, when, when you're getting into a relationship with a person that you want to talk to them about how much they're going to end up closing for, how much this, uh, how much, it, so 6%, right? Let's say you're signing a listing for 6%. You want to let them know how much that's going to cost them in the whole um, time uh, at closing. What are their closing costs? So you have a seller, you know they're just squeaking through to get this sold, being really careful with your numbers, really honest with your numbers and saying, I know you wanna get this sold, but we can't get into it. Let, let's say, you know they can sell it at 250,000 and they got an offer for 248,000. You go, you know, I think you'll be able to be fine and get out of this, but they, they, bought, they have that offer and now they can't come up with all the closing costs. Sellers can't get out of a contract if, oh, by the way, you have to bring $2,000 to closing. Well, too bad. You have to bring $2,000 to closing. You can't just bail, right? So just being really careful with your numbers and representing people well. So it's not like, oh, well, I made a mistake. It's kind of a, um, kind of an important one. You have a lot in article two, which, which goes to uh, misrepresentation, exaggeration. 
lake view and you know there's like one place on the property you can kind of like see a little bit of glimmer from the lake just things like that we have to be careful there's a difference between I, it's, there's a word for it it's like a little bit of it you're just boosting like it's really pretty that's different than saying it has brand new siding when the siding's falling off kind of thing so um non-material okay i have a couple of these i'm sorry there's just so much in here i know we don't have a lot of time um, okay, here's one standard. I'm going skipping all the way to, uh, to Article Three. Here's one about uh, compensation. I don't know if, if you remember this, but the whole respa thing. If you're getting compensation from any source, you have to be really honest with both parties about where that compensation is coming from. Let's say you have a seller who uh, wants to give you a bonus. They say if anybody will sell this house before the end of October. I will give a $3,000 bonus to that buyer's agent. So you are super ethical about setting up all your showings for the buyer's agent, uh, for the buyer, and you go and show these 10 properties and you're really hoping they choose the one with a $3,000 bonus because you're getting 3% and the 3,000, that's awesome. But you really need to disclose that immediately to your person. So you can see how it would look if you got into the contract and then all of a sudden at closing, they find out somehow that you're getting an extra $3,000 and then they start thinking in their head, well, did, I'm just picking on people. I hate picking on people, but I'm just looking at the name. So Hosiah, like, well, did Hosiah tell me, was there any time during the last six weeks that he told me to buy this house or he encouraged me to stick with the contract that I could have failed? Do you think it's because he got 3,000 extra dollars? Well, then in their mind just starts spinning and it just looks terrible. So really what you need to do is to disclose it up front. So let's say you're showing property and you can disclose it right then. Look, I'm letting you know that um, there's a $3,000 bonus on this property if I was to sell it. Um, and then you could deal with that. Maybe you wanna split it with the buyer. If you're a buyer's agent and they say, well, you should give it to me and you go, okay, I'll do that. Because really it is their money because it's, it's possible that they could have taken a $3,000 price reduction. Instead, they're trying to encourage you with it. It's kind of unethical to take that money when your buyer could have been doing something for a cheaper price, right? So if you're getting a bonus from it, it needs to be just at least disclosed. And maybe you get lucky and the, the buyer says, you know, you've been working hard. If I choose this home, you get to keep the 3,000, but it makes a lot more ethically, it makes a lot more sense to at least be splitting it with the person, if not saying, hey, it's a $3,000 bonus. How about like, do you want two grand? I don't know. It's just, it's unethical to kind of take it. We kind of try to encourage people not to do that when they have a listing here. It's okay. It's just, it brings up a lot of ethical questions as to how people are going to um, act when they, when they have that. Do you guys have any questions about that? Have you seen that? Luis, you probably dealt with that a lot more than other people just having new product. You see that a lot. Like developers, that's what they, they would want to do is say, come on, buy my stuff. Here's, here's some thousand dollars because they get that that works, right? There was, there was just an um, email that came from, came through for a home in Crestview. If you sell it, you get a 2,500 buyer's agent bonus. And there's nothing wrong with offering that, but there is something right. wrong when you with take not, it and don't tell your person. And don't tell. Yep. Yep. That's all it is. That's why it's, it's kind of messy. And it's like, if you want to do that, that's cool but you're trying to encourage the buyer to buy. And by saying to encourage the realtor to tell their buyer to buy, it's just, it's weird. It, I'm not putting anyone down if that's how you encourage your seller to get a sale. There's nothing wrong with it at all. Now I'm saying when you're on the receiving end of it. So, okay. Actually, Heather. Oh, go ahead. We have a closing on Tuesday on, on one of our lots up here at Canyon Pine. Um, that we're giving a $2,500 um, $2, buyer agent, buyer agent uh, credit. And you're on the listing side though, right? Yes. We're also yeah. the well, uh, we're also the sellers. Oh, you're the sellers. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. Absolutely nothing wrong. And it works, right? It works. People wouldn't do it if it didn't work. Right. Yeah. You, you see it a lot more when the market's bad. You see it all the time. Like, you know, what should I do? And every seller will ask you that. So if you're on the seller side, do not like discourage them from doing it. It's when you're on the buyer side, just be sure you know how you're going to handle that. Does that make sense? So if your seller comes to you and says, 
Um, should I do a $3,000 price reduction or should I do $3,000 of an agent bonus? You know, as you get to be a better agent, you'll know what's going to work on that situation. So anything you want to say about that other than that it works? Yeah. Sometimes you just got to do bottles it. Bottles of wine sometimes work too. What was that, Stacey? Patrick and I gave away bottles of wine to any agent bringing in a, a buyer through our listing. Yeah, you did that up and there and I thought it was a great idea, right? Anybody who's had... saying, how do I get showings? My seller yeah. wants to get showings. I said, buy a case of wine. Just give one to yeah, everybody. Yeah, and we gave wine away. It. And we had a couple of agents show it like two or three times and they got yeah. a bottle of wine. <laughs> it's not that expensive. It's like 10 bucks a piece and your seller was super happy. He owns a lot of property. He might list again with you. So it wasn't, and, and I remember telling Patrick, he goes, for each person that shows it, I'm like, well, do you want to keep the listing? You had like, what, 30 days to keep the listing. It was a great idea. Yeah, yeah. And I don't think you'd have to disclose the bottle of wine. If you did, you might make stuff. a joke about it and say like, hey. I just buy them a bottle of wine. Yeah, what are you going to do? It's a bottle of wine. Um, okay, so, and that would, okay, so the only other thing on compensation, I guess that would be a practical application is there's a box in MLS. And if you check it, it means that there's a variable rate. So it says variable rate, yes or no. And as a new agent, you're filling out a listing. You're like, I don't know what this means. Variable rate means if I bring the buyer, Mr. you're trying to get the listing and they go, well, I'm not going to pay you 6%. I'll pay you. If you bring the buyer, will you do it for less? You say, sure. It's an easy give when you're trying to get a listing because most times you're not bringing the buyer, right? So you could put that in the listing agreement. Yeah, if I bring the buyer, I'll reduce it to, you know, half a percent or uh, 1%, right, on the buyer side. So instead of six, it's gonna be five and a half, or it's gonna be five. Um, you write that up in the listing, you're probably never gonna have to deal with it because somebody else is gonna bring the buyer, but you check the box that says variable rate, yes, okay? And then what that's saying, if you're on a multiple offer situation, you check to see if you're on the buyer side, Check in the MLS, see if that box is checked yes. And if it is, then you're asking the agent, they say, oh yeah, you're in a multiple offer situation. There's two other people that brought offers. You can say, so are you one of the people that has an offer? And if so, what is the variable rate? Because in the MLS, the reason you say whether there is one is so that that agent has an opportunity to reduce their commission to match yours. That makes sense? So if it's that agent bringing it and you know they're going to reduce their commission, then you by, by all sakes, like call them and say, I'm going to make this an even, tell your buyer, say, look, they are doing it with, um, they're doing it for two and a half percent on the buyer side if they get both sides. So I'm going to even reduce mine to 2% because I want you guys to have no reason not to get this property. You do what you have to do, but just know it has to be disclosed if you're on the list side. You can't just hold that close to your heart and go, <laughs> like, I have a better deal. That's another way that you have to be fair, fair and honest with clients, uh, not with clients, but with the public. Oh, here's a good one. So it's the obligation, this is 3.5, of sub-agents to promptly disclose all pertinent facts to the principal's agent prior to blah, blah, blah. Just as you gotta like disclose facts. So we had a situation in this office. I don't, I don't know how this happened because the agent had, she's been, I shouldn't have said that, but the person has been in business 20 years and, um, they had a listing and they had it for a long time and it finally got an offer and it was like, oh, thank God, this is going to sell. Well, they find out during the process, they got it newly surveyed and found out that the part of the house was not on the property. So part of the house, like it was like, okay, maybe it wasn't like the, the building. I think it was like, it was definitely the septic system was over, definitely part of the driveway. And I think it was like the, the deck or something. So she found out this information, but she didn't want to upset the buyers because they were trying to get through the inspection, right? <laughs> so she just didn't tell them. And now a couple weeks went by, weeks, not just like days. And she goes, oh, so when do I have to tell them about this? I'm like, oh my God, like, like immediately, like do you realize you need to do things immediately when you have negative information about a property? Because what if that person had now spent an extra $500, they decided to put their home on the market. They now have it under contract. They now have spent money on that house. They now ordered a moving van. Like what if they did any of those things? They could totally sue you if they found out that you had held that information because you were causing them harm, okay? So just know if you have negative information. I, I was saying like, okay, you got a bad, bad news. The buyer bailed. You don't wanna ruin someone's night. Like that's not gonna hurt them if you wait till the morning so that they're ready, getting ready for work and then they get bad news and it doesn't like cause them not to sleep, but at least they can handle it better. 
um, this is different. That's like, you have a bad fact. You just found out something bad. Like you call that other agent if you're under contract and say, I am so sorry, we didn't know this before we're under contract, but here's the deal. Here's the information. You don't just say, oh, when is the deadline that I have to give this information? If you have it, you give it, you let them know. And it's okay to have like an agent confidential remark if you know it before you go under contract to just say, hey, ask me about the survey. You don't have to go in your MLS listing and go, by the way, this house isn't on the right property. You just have a way of saying it at the right time. So if you ever struggle with that, when's the appropriate time to tell a person this? Just come see me because it does make sense. You don't want to tell someone who's going to see a house. Um, 10 years ago, we had this horrible mold issue and then we had to replace all these things. Like you don't have to tell them before they saw the house. There are appropriate times to see it. I'm talking about when you have an active contract. Let me see, I got a whole bunch of these I had started. I wanna make sure there wasn't anything. Here's one. Uh, okay, this is skipping a lot because I know we're kind of running out of time all the way to standard 16. This is one I wanted to make sure I covered and then I can go back to other ones if there's time. You, you can make general cross announcements to prospects during their service and terms of availability, blah, blah, blah. Although recipients may have entered into agent agreements or exclusive re relationships with another realtor. I, I think there's a, a fine line when you, you, you can be taught that it is legal that if you see a listing, uh, if you see a sign in the yard that says it's for sale, it's not illegal to knock on the person's door and say, I see your house is for sale. Are you looking for a buyer's agent to help you purchase a home? It's not illegal, but it's a super fine line. And in a small town like we are, it's a really bad idea, okay? There is a totally different line when you have a person who is in a relationship with somebody, they have a listing with someone and they come and contact you and say, hey, I think my agent is terrible. And I have some questions for you about what I should be doing right now. Um, I'm under contract and I think my listing agent just doesn't know what they're doing. Can I ask you your advice? No, no, they are under contract. Like they have a signed thing with someone else. So you also come see me about how to navigate that because it's really hard but you don't wanna be getting in the way. It's called torturous interference with a contract to be getting in the way of somebody else's contract and what they're doing. So um, there's a way to, if somebody comes to you and says, I think my agent has no idea what they're doing. I have a listing and I would like to, I would like to talk to you about taking that listing over. There's a way to say it that, okay, we can have that conversation. You can't approach them. You can't go and call someone and say, hey, I think your agent, you might not be happy with this agent. Do you wanna to talk to me about when your listing agreement's over to come over to me? You can't make the call, but people can always call you and you can set up a, a, a time with them to discuss what you can do different. You can never say negative things about that other person. I've had some really bad deals with agents who are terrible, they're unethical, they're terrible, they don't call their people, they don't do anything, but then if that, seller was to call me and say, we'd love to talk to you. We think our agent's a total jerk. You can't say, oh my God, they're such a jerk. Yeah, I totally agree with you. No, you would just <laughs> only say what's nice or say, oh, okay, I understand. I'm really sorry you're having such a tough time. Let's set up an appointment and we can talk to you about what I do differently, right? So you can say it in a way that you're not negatively uh, talking about someone else. And you have to do that. No matter how much you hate that other person, you have to keep it positive and talk to them about going with them once their listing is about to expire. You can't also say, well, you could go talk to their managing broker and go cancel your listing. You could encourage them to, if you're not happy with your agent and you wanted to talk to me about advice, why don't you just go talk to their manager? And they, oh, thank you so much. They, you could kind of send them away or at least come talk to me about how to, how to navigate that. But I hope that makes sense. We have an agent out in Mancus who I just found out two days ago. She's um, unbelievable. We don't have an agent out in Mancus who did this. It's another person that just has a bad reputation. And she went up to some sellers who sold their property through us. And she's a small town. And this other agent saw them on the street after the sale. And they said, hey, yeah, so-and-so, we, we got our house sold. Because people always wanna, they're, they're happy. They sold their house. And this agent goes, yeah, you sure could have gotten a lot more money with me. Like, come on. So those kind of things are totally not, it's not illegal to say, this is not a law. It's just 
it's you're not allowed to do that with our code of ethics please tell me if you guys have questions i've had people it's calling going behind the sign if you uh go behind the sign and you want to uh, oh uh you want to uh get a person to come and list with you instead of the person they're with it's called going behind the sign you can definitely get in trouble for that uh it's also why when we do a mailer you don't have to go through and pick out everybody who has a listing but if you pick out this person who has a listing, you better pick out that person who has a listing. So just, if you're gonna send out a post postcard, no big deal, you add one sentence at the bottom that says not intended to solicit currently listed property. And then go ahead and send it to everyone in the neighborhood. You don't have to like go and be careful about who you send it to. Hope that makes sense. Um, see if there's any others that you really wanna talk, wanna make sure inspections. Sorry, I was reading something, but they were notes to a different class. <sighs> She'll not know us late. And, and if you're angry at someone, it's okay. Uh, if you're angry at someone, just come talk to me again. I'm happy to walk you through it, but you don't want to uh, go and make false complaints at the, uh, the Real Estate Commission. I really encourage you, if you have someone who's being unethical, to take the time in your lives to make a complaint. I've had to do it before four people in this office because I felt like it was such an egregious thing that happened that I helped the agent like create that complaint for the real estate commission. But you guys all get busy. And if someone is being uh, unethical out there, there aren't that many bad eggs. Uh, but when someone is a bad egg, they usually know the rules very well. And they're going to skirt the rules just enough that you don't, you can't really prove it. Like you can't prove that that person didn't put your offer in but there's a good chance that they didn't put your offer in because they had an offer and they wanted to seal up the deal before your offer got in there. They knew the offer was coming, so they got it under contract and, oh, no, I never got a phone call from Stacey. She didn't tell me she was getting an offer. So, you know, like you can't really prove that, but if you have someone, you know that that person has a bad reputation out there, just ask me. I know who the bad eggs I've heard about are. But you know they did something egregious. Like, please think about taking the time. Let's say it's to a, an hour and a half it might take you to really write out what happened and put that on record at the real estate commission. Um, talk to me about it first before you were to do that because a lot of people, the reason they don't wanna do it is they don't want their name. They don't want so-and-so knowing that you put that, that, that into the commission. Most of the uh, issues get dismissed, but it at least becomes on their record that someone complained about it. So if they keep getting complaints about the same thing, then yes, at least they can take action against that person. I just feel like we all have to help our industry. Um, we all have to help our industry have high standards. And I, I think it's important to me so I can help you kind of craft it. I was kind of bummed with the one that I did, I thought was super egregious and the person should probably not have a license. And of course it was like nothing happened and they went, they went off on their way. I was like, Ugh! but at least it also is a positive outlook to instead of just like getting angry at the person to actually do something about it, so. Um, I really, I don't want to, it's already 210 and there's, I haven't even gotten like part of this done, but at least I hope that was helpful to know that if you ever have questions about that stuff, just come see me and, and sometimes do take the time. If you're really like, can't sleep at night, <laughs> you're up worried about your deals, go read the code of ethics. It'll make you feel better. About it. <laughs>